Thank you for coming to today's Biogeochemistry Science Friday. Today, Yao Ping Wang of uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is going to talk to us about quantification of human contribution to soil moisture based terrestrial aridity. Go ahead, Yao Ping. Yeah, thanks, Forrest. Yeah, so Forrest has already said the title of my study. Uh, the, so the reason we are doing this study is because there have been a lot of reports of increasing terrestrial aridity under climate change. And the detection and attribution analysis have shown that anthropogenic forces are responsible for these changes. However, those past detection and attribution studies mostly focused on meteorological drought index or the primary drought severity index. They also mostly focus on annual average or summer average changes. As a result, there is still very high uncertainty in how those anthropogenic forces affect the soil moisture based aridity, which is affected by the additional factors such as vegetation and soil texture much more severely than the meteorological drought indices. And also there is high uncertainty with regards to how the seasonal and the vertical variability exists in those anthropogenic impacts. So for my study, the objective is to fill this research gap by asking how anthropogenic forces affect soil moisture-based aridity in different seasons and soil layers. To answer this question, we have developed the merged soil moisture data sets and conducted the detection and attribution using that merged soil moisture data set on a standardized soil moisture index, which is the soil moisture based drought index. And we also used the future simulations to analyze how the anthropogenic signals and changes are occurring in the same index. For the development of the soil moisture data set, our objective is to take as many existing data sets as possible and combine those different climate periods and the soil layers to form a consistent global multi-layer data set, which covers the 1971 to 2016 period at monthly half degree resolution. Our source data sets include a long, a long satellite, long, long period satellite data set that is a European Space Agency CC, CCI data set. I think it starts from 1978 onwards. So it is itself a combination of different satellites and they have already done the homogenization. But this one only covers the surface layer. And to supplement that, we also used the, the reanalysis data set from the listed five sources. We also took a bunch of offline land surface model simulations from the GeoDAS project and uh, the ERA land only offline simulation, as well as the MISMIP and Shandy intermodal comparison project. And finally, we also used the, the SIMI5 and SIMI6 or system model simulation. We also tested the different merging methods for these data sets, which include the unweighted averaging and then optimal least squares, which is, an, is based on observations and the, uh, which, which divide, derives the set of weights based on observational constraint. And uh, it's also a weighted averaging method. And then we also used a emergent constraint method using precipitation and temperature. So that one is correcting for the realism of the forcing in those data. And because these soil source data sets have different soil layer and the time coverage, we first interpolated those whenever possible to four different soil layers. And for the time period concatenation, we use the cumulative distribution function mapping, which is the same as done on the ESA CCI data. So this is the overview of the, of the procedure. You can see so for the three methods, we applied them on different combinations of the source product. And we roughly divided the source product based on their time coverage into three three different sets. So some covered the whole 
period of interest. Some only cover until 2010, some only cover from the 1980 onward. And so forth. And whenever this, um, this data set do not cover the whole period, we use the cumulative function, cumulative distribution function based concatenation to derive the final product. So as a result of this test of different combinations, we have derived the seven products in this testing. So then we first used the reserved in situ observation from the International Soil Moisture Network to evaluate the performances of the merged data set. So the individual color dots are showing the merged data sets and the box plots are showing the source data set. So ORS is including all the satellite reanalysis and the offline land surface model simulation and SMIP5 and SMIP6 is as uh, easily understood, it's just the Earth system models themselves. And then for different rows, it's showing in turn the bias, root mean square error, and the Pearson correlation, whereas the columns are the four different soil layers. So across all of this, the pattern is similar. The merged data sets are always performing better than the corresponding source data set. And uh, also, if we focus on the ORS column, these are usually better than the products that are based on the semi models. So this shows the merging procedure is working when compared to observation. And we, and we also did a sanity check for our merged product. So first, we compared them against the other unmerged regional or short coverage global data set to see if it is exhibiting reasonable spatial and temporal behavior. So it's the, it's, I'm compressing this a little bit. So this graph is showing the comparison results. And in general, it's also showing that uh, the merged products are agreeing better than those, uh, those regional or short coverage data sets, which usually have high resolution of, um, or more advanced algorithms. So all, of, all of our merged data sets passed this sanity check. Then because our source data sets have different uh, temporal coverages, we also perform the homogeneity test against, against the major breakpoints in our data coverage. So we broke them into three periods, 1970 to 1918. 1981 to 2010 and post 2010. And uh, so these percentages are about the percentages of global pixels where the our where our data sets uh, did not pass the statistical test on homogeneity. And for for the temporal average, there is no homogeneity detected. For the standard deviation, there are some inhomogeneity detected, but it happens in the semi-5 and semi-6 data sets as well as the OR, ORS, the satellite and the offline simulation-based data set. So because the semi Earth system models should not have any temporal discontinuity because they are available for, for the whole, the historical simulations are, are continuous from 1950 onwards, this means the the standard deviation is the, the the lack of homogeneity is probably ca caused by some difference in the simulation of disturbance processes between the between our sources and the, the other data sets that we have compared. So we consider this to be not a big issue. And then we also tested this. Uh, Similarity of the simulated spatial temporal series in our in our merged data set against the Palma drought severity indexed indicated major drought events, including in the United States and the, the Australian Millennium drought. So it's shown on the top of this graph here. And uh, we found that the slide and offline model-based uh, data sets is able to capture the 
progression of the drought better than the semi five or semi six based data. And the, finally, for the fourth sanity check, uh, we used the, the spectral used used the, the spectrum uh, to determine whether the variability in the in the merged soil moisture values have shrunk because of the averaging process. And we found in general the colored lines, which are showing the spectrum of the merged data sets are generally within the confidence interval of the source data set. So there is no apparent shrinkage of the variance. So this is just showing the climatology and uncertainty of the merged data. So the climatology pattern is somewhat different across the individual products, but they are all showing the regional pattern of uh, just the wet tropical forest and the dry Sahara desert in the Middle East area. And the right panel is showing the uncertainty, which are estimated following the uh, proper procedure of the original merging method. So for this one, we did find out that there is a difference between the merging method. So the emerging constraint method is probably underestimating the uncertainty too much, whereas the unweighted average method is showing a more reasonable uncertainty. In summary, this uh, data set development produced merged products that are of higher quality than the original sources and they have reasonable statistical properties and continuity. And also the realism of the original sources matter to the final result. If, if the sources are including only those that are affected by observations, such as the satellite observations or the reanalysis and offline simulations, then the merged results perform much better than those based on coupled simulation, which are not driven by observed meteorological variables. And finally, the uncertainty estimation still needs some improvement. So with this uh, merged data set developed, we proceeded to the performance of the historical detection and attribution. Of, so this requires the uh, forced, individually forced simulations which we took from the CMIP-6 historical simulations and the CMIP-6 EAMIP simulations, which covers individual forces such as, uh, such as greenhouse gases, aerosols, and solar volcanic variability. And to emphasize the large scale variability, we averaged the, the global data set into five degree latitudinal averages. And we also focused just on the either the surface soil layer from 10 to 0 to 10 centimeters and the root stone soil layer from 0 to 100 centimeters. We converted the global data set all to the three months standardized soil moisture index. And then from the historical simulation of the semi under all forces, we derived that. Uh, the large scale pattern of soil moisture change using empirical orthogonal function analysis. So this, the result of this is called the fingerprint in this, uh, in this kind of DA method. And then using this fingerprint, we projected the ensemble simulations under various other forces and the pseudo observation from the merged product, as well as the unforced uh, pre-industrial control run. So by this projection, we derived long time series. And then we calculated the moving window trends on these time series. So the L year here is the size of the time window for 1971 to 2016, that is 46 years. And then, then with those trends, with the histor individual historical force ensembles, uh, the ensemble member can uh, help us estimate the probability distribution of the force signals, which are the trends uh, over the historical period. 
with the pseudo observation, there is just one trend, so that constitutes the pseudo observation signal. And finally, with unforced control run, there are many trends, so this will form a estimation of the probability distribution of the noise. So with the simulated and the observed signals and the simulated noises estimated, we um, proceed to the detection and the attribution process. So first, we, we still check whether the, whether the model simulated trend and the fingerprints look reasonable. So uh, what, this is showing, the, what this is showing is that this is the global average time series. And the black is the field observation, and the blue is the simulated uncertainty and the average over all the historical and uh, future ensembles. So all these are showing that over time, the global terrestrial, global land surface is drying. And also there is uh, more rapid drying for the surface soil layer at 10, 0 to 10 centimeters than the root zone soil layer um, at uh, 0 to 100 centimeters, as can be seen by the slope of this blue line. And this is a latitudinal distribution of the trend. So overall, both the observed pseudo observation and the simulation are showing wetting in the subtropics. And for this, this um, March through May period, this kind of displays the discrepancy is caused partly by the Sahara Desert, which deem, we deem that the pseudo observation actually has a forcing problem because of the because of the ERA reanalysis forcing is somewhat wrong. And then both the data sets are showing drying in the mid latitudes of both hemisphere and wetting in the northern high latitude in the spring. And from these trends to the fingerprint, we can also see that the fingerprint is showing quite similar patterns to the trend. So this means there is a very dominant component of soil moisture change, and the fingerprint will adequately represents this change. So using the signals and noise ratio, we judge whether a anthropogenic signal, anthropogenic forcing has significantly affected the pseudo observation signal by, uh, by determining whether the signal is above the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval of the noise. So this difference would mean uh, the pseudo the signal inside the pseudo observation is considerably different than expected without any forcing. And then to attribute the detected signal to a forcing, we compare the signal of the pseudo observation to the confidence intervals of the individual forced signals. If it is within the 95% confidence interval, then we determine that we decide that the signal is attributable to that specific forcing. The, this graph is uh, for the surface soil layer and is comparing the pseudo observation signal with the confidence interval of the various forced simulated signal and the noise. So the black interval is the confidence interval of the noise and the individual colored probability distributions are from uh, individually forced simulations, and the vertical black line is the pseudo observation. So the, I use the red boxes to highlight where the amount where the significant presence of human signals are, de are detected. And if you compare the vertical black line to the to the to the color, the gray shading, you can see that in these months the pseudo observation signal or it is a noise. And moreover, if you look at um, if you look at the black probability distribution and the orange one and the purple and the, the magenta ones, then you can see the pseudo observation is very much right in the middle of those probability distribution. So it means the pseudo observed signal can be well explained by first all forces combined together the anthropogenic only forcing, 
which is the all force minus the natural variability, and then the combined greenhouse gases and the aerosol forcing, or just using the greenhouse gas forcing. And then if you compare the pseudo observation signal to the blue and the green probability distributions, you can see it is generally outside the 95% interval of those. So this means the aerosol forcing along or the natural solar volcanic variability cannot explain the pseudo observed signal. And a similar things is found for the root on third layer, but we have more monks being detectable and attributable to the anthropogenic forces. This is pretty much spanning from September to April so during the late summer and the cold season of the year. So we also examined the, whether, the, uh, whether the significance of the anthropogenic signal is varying even inside those detectable, detected months. To do that, we used the concept of detection time. So we fixed the first year of the time period of analysis always at 1971. And then if you remember the window length L from a microcedural graph a couple slides before. So I increased the window length from 10 years to 46 years. And uh, the year when the field observation was first detectable and attributable to the four, all four things are considered here to be the detection time. And you can see the detection year is always earlier than 2016. So it means that even during an earlier historical period, the anthropogenic signal has already become detectable. And, uh, and the earliest detection time is in October. So it means uh, late summer to autumn, there is very strong anthropogenic impact on the soil moisture aridity. And in the other, in, in the spring months, it's around the 2010. So with the historical detection attribution showing significant impacts of the anthropogenic signals, we also analyzed how, how this human signal changes in the future. So to do that, we first needed to address the bias problem inside the future simulation. Because the historical and the future model simulations are sharing the same bias, what we found is that the future signal to noise and the historical in the simulated models are generally inflated compared to the pseudo observation. So we want to remove that, uh, uh, remove the inflation. And to do that, we use the emergent constraint. Um, so, to, so emergent constraint is a commonly used method to reduce, um, to reduce uncertainty in future climate projection. And it requires a historical variable to be significantly correlated with the future variable inside the climate models. And this, the, future, the historical variable should have a observational correspondence. And, the, and then you can plug in the historical variable inside the emergent constraint relationship to derive a historical observation constraint future variable. It also requires the historical and the future relationship inside of those climate models have a, have, have a physical basis. So to justify our application to soil moisture signal to noise ratio here, we, have, uh, we checked that the first that the past studies have reported that various drivers of soil moisture exhibit this emergent constraint property. And we also checked that these drivers and the soil moisture have, have, a, have a consistent correlation pattern over time, which is showing on the right-hand side graph here. So the vertical different rows are for the different soil layers are showing how the correlation pattern changes over time. And the columns are individual drivers, so including precipitation, air temperature, leaf area index, and the snow water equivalent. So you can see the spatial patterns are quite consistent. So it means with the driver having emergent constraint themselves and then having steady relationship with soil moisture, then there is a very good likelihood that soil moisture also have a 
emergent constraint. So we indeed, uh, okay, so, so to, to perform this in emergent constraint, then we need to find out whether the historical and future relationship are statistically significant. So to conduct this regression, we face another difficulty. This, the future signal to noise ratio is a time series, but the conventional linear regression based emergent constraint is usually dealing with just a future time slide. So the linear regression would have on the x axis the historical variable, and on the y axis it has the future variable for just one time period. But we want to maintain the continuity of the future time series in our signal to noise ratio. Therefore, we develop a generalized, we chose a generalized additive model instead of the conventional linear regression model. And uh, we formed the model such that uh, um, the, the relationship between the historical and the future signal to noise ratio will always be modeled as linear inside of the model. But the dependence of that uh, coefficient on time will be modeled by a cubic spline. So we fitted the generalized additive model for all the months and soil layers, and what we did find all of them are significant at uh, p equals p less source small, less than or equal to 0 0.05. So this means emergent constraint is relationship is significant between the historical and future signal to noise ratios. Sorry, was there a question? Hmm. So this is the result of our signal to noise ratio. It's showing individual months and, and this, the two third layers are, are stacked on the same plot. So the dotted lines are the original signal to noise ratios and the solid lines are the constrained ones. So inside any of the graphs, you can see the dotted lines generally are above the solid lines. So this means before the constraint, the signal to noise ratio are indeed inflated. And after the constraint, you can see difference between the surface and the root zone soil layer. So in the surface soil layer, you can see originally it, it had it it has very little signal, but it has very strong increasing trend over time in almost all the months. So this means the signal, the anthropogenic signal seem to be becoming stronger and stronger in the surface soil layer. And for the root zone soil layer, um, in the very hot months, it also having an increasing trend, but it also started below the detection threshold indicated by the horizontal black line here. And in the colder months where it is already detected in the historical period, you can see it is not increasing as much. It's just maintaining a steady existence. So we also propagated the, this emergent constraint on signal to noise ratio to future, chain, future trends in the standardized soil moisture index. To, prop to perform this propagation, we used the fact that empirical orthogonal function is a linear transformation, and the li li linear, linear trend is also a linear transformation, and superimposing this uh, actually creates a relationship between the trend and the signal-to-noise ratio related through the fingerprint of the, of the soil moisture, and that soil moisture index. So we just... Uh, decomposition on the original data set, and we rep replaced the original signal-to-noise ratio by the emergent constraint signal-to-noise ratio. And the results are compared between the top row and the bottom row here. So you can see in the bottom row for the surface soil layer, there is a, a, a quite clear reduction in the magnitude of the trend. So the, the, the correction indicates the future surface soil moisture is not drying as much as indicated by the original uncorrected simulation, but it's still having quite a strong and accelerating drying trend over time. So the root zone soil layer 
on the same correction still reduced the trend, but uh, but in general the trend in binding trend in the root tongue layer is weaker than the surface layer, and the, the wetting trend in the subtropic and the, in the northern hemisphere in spring is also quite stronger. Finally, we analyzed how the future trends are accounted for by different drivers using a regression analysis. So this is the same for soil moisture drivers as mentioned before. So top is precipitation, temperature, and the leaf area index, and the snow water equivalent. So this, this column is showing the trends in the drivers themselves. Precipitation is increasing and decreasing depending on where you are. Temperature and leaf area index is generally increasing and snow water equivalent is decreasing. And the result of these changes is that precipitation is driving the wetting of the subtropics and also in the northern hemisphere in spring. The temperature is driving much of the drying in the mid latitude. But it's also interesting to note there is a uh, getting some of the northern hemisphere, in particular in high latitude in spring, is getting a little bit colder. Um, and this is driving some wetting of the soil moisture. For leaf area index, it seems the uh, increase is driving a widespread drying in the high latitude. And snow water equivalence is driving some uh, drying of the spring in the northern hemisphere. So all of these are, are reasonable results. Um, so temperature and the leaf area index will be driving the increase in evapotranspiration and the snow water equivalent by with the decreasing snowpack, there will be more soil exposed to the atmospheric demand and also, early, also um, earlier leaf out and the, the vegetation being now covered by snow and subjected to it. Uh, withdraw, will be drawing water from the soil for evapotranspiration. So in summary, we in this study, we demonstrated that historical changes in standardized soil moisture index is attributable to anthropogenic forces, especially greenhouse gases. And that there are clear latitudinal and seasonal and vertical patterns. So the latitudinal pattern is prevalent mid-latitude drying and wetting in the subtrop northern subtropics and the root zone in spring in high latitudes. And these are driven by temperature leaf area. The drying trends are driven by temperature leaf area and snow melt, whereas the wetting trends are driven by temperature and precipitation. So, so the the for, for the surface soil layers, the detectable changes are happening in late summer to autumn, whereas the detectable root zone changes are happening in September until next year, April. And the future drying are accelerating faster in the root zone than the, uh, in, in the surface than the root zone. So this concludes my presentation. And I thank for the other funding agencies, for my collaborators and myself, which made this research possible. And this is the link to the two manuscripts based on this work. Thanks.